Okay, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's a powerful, living, active word. Thank you that it addresses us in our situation day by day. And we ask that as we break into this new series, looking at the genuine Jesus, as we look at him today being the bread of life, these I am's in John's Gospel, we pray that you will help us to learn from you. We pray that you will bring amongst us those who will profit from this word, even here and, and online together. And pray that you will honour your servant Jesus as we meditate upon him together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, this is an interesting question to me, and I'm asking for a particular reason. How many of us manage to go through a day without eating any bread? Do you, do you have many days when you don't eat any bread? <laughs> Who did you, Caleb? In school you have hardly In school you don't have any hardly any, but when you come home? Before we had lunch, so we don't feed you again. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do, we do. It's like this, you have bread with dinner. Yeah, yeah, we have bread with dinner, don't we? Quite often. Mm -hmm. yeah. Normally you have, have some bread in the day. Yeah. And maybe you have some toast for breakfast, maybe you have a sandwich at lunchtime, maybe you eat, eat, eat quite a bit of bread. I've noticed a tailing off in the trend. Uh, my grandparents' generation, for example, used to eat a lot more bread. Uh, perhaps as a younger man, certainly when I was a bit more fit and athletic, when I was rowing and stuff, certainly I don't, I don't know if you remember that I had a loaf of bread for lunch. Uh, that would be lunch. <clears throat> I guess it's perceptions of what's healthy and perceptions of weight gain and loss and stuff like that, is it? People will eat pasta instead of something, or they'll have rice. I've noticed guys uh, even turning up on, on jobs and, and, and working with people and they turn up and they'll have a a plastic container, and, and in there they've got their pasta for their lunch, <laughs> these I've heard of. You know, whatever happened to a bacon sandwich? Yeah. Basically, we're used to society, people of my age anyway, used to society, where bread is a staple in life. If we were living in um, China, we might say Jesus is the rice of life. Because basically what's going on here is that we're being told that Jesus is the bread of life, the staple. The basis of nutrition and life in the world that Jesus occupies is bread. You'd have something else with it, as we'll see in a minute, but you'd have your bread, and that would be your foundation <coughs> on which the rest was hanging, as it were. Now, our verse describes Jesus as the bread of life, so let's be sure we set it in its context, because the context is really important. <clears throat> in John 4, 49-50, Jesus has begun his Galilean ministry. Well, John 4, 45, he goes to Galilee, he arrives in Galilee, his home territory. And in John 4, 49-50, he deals with a prominent official that he comes across there, a royal official, whose son was dying. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus replied, You may go, your son will live. How do you feel if, if you know, your, your granny or your auntie or your son or your daughter dropped down in the street and an ambulance was called and the ambulance man turned over, oh yeah, I'll go, right? And cleared off. Well, Jesus. Wouldn't be so bad if it was Jesus, because Jesus isn't an ambulance man, is he? He's the Lord of life. He's the Lord who gives life, and he speaks the word and brings to life. So in this situation, he speaks the word. He says, off you go. Son's going to live. And the man took Jesus at his word and departed. And while he was still on the way, the servants met him with the news of God's living. Three verses... Life radically changed, enhanced, saved, bang. That's what Jesus does, says John. That's what Jesus does. The genuine Jesus does that. He takes life, radically changes, enhances and saves. That's the genuine Jesus. Now his next encounter comes about in Jerusalem at the pool of Bethesda, near the Sheep Gate, we're told. So, <clears throat> has Jesus travelled back to Jerusalem from Galilee? Well, John hasn't told us that, he's just telling us where the next incident took place. What he's doing is he's not giving us a chronological travelogue of Jesus' travels. His interest isn't geography, his interest is, who is this Jesus? So he's bringing together accounts that serve his theological purpose, tell us about who this Jesus is. It's not a chronological account. John is telling us as much, explicitly. John 5, 2 follow. Gives us the full geographical details so we can see these are not chronological travelogues 
of the genuine Jesus, not his travel plans, but his character, his purpose, what he's about, what he does. So, <clears throat> we're still studying the verse we're coming to in the context of the genuine Jesus. What happens next? After the royal official's son, here we are, Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda. A great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed used to lie there. And one had that been one was there who'd been an invalid for thirty-eight years, imagine. When Jesus saw him lying there, and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him a really stupid question. What a stupid question. This is this is not just pre welfare state, this is pre wheelchairs. Okay? This is a guy who's relying on people to pick him up and carry him to this pool. He hasn't got anybody. He's a guy stuck, isn't he? And he's been there for 38 years. And Jesus says, do you want to get well? And it's a bit obvious. So the invalid replied, I've no one to help me into the pool when the water's stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. They used to believe that if he's got them where the water had been stirred, he'd be healed. So Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. He can't pick up his mat. He has to have somebody else pick up his mat and move him. He hasn't got anybody else to pick it up and move it for him. And Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. And once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and he walked. And here again, with this account, you know, written within the lifetime. We've got some very early copies of John's Gospel got from about 60 AD there in the British Museum. Within the lifetime of the people who were around. Here again is Jesus touching a person's life and by his word of command he says, get up, pick up your mat, pick up your own mat. And walk. And once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and he walked. Here's what Jesus does. Here's what the genuine Jesus does. The life again, once again, rescued, so that what had been poor and desperate is revolutionized, changed, taken out of a life of pre-welfare state, lonely, unaided sickness, and that guy becomes able, capable, and re-empowered. Here's what the genuine Jesus does. Now, of course, there's a bit of a sideline. This happened on the Jewish Sabbath. So there's a stark contrast drawn immediately between religiosity and what the genuine Jesus is all about. John 5, 9, the day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. I think it's a miracle the guy didn't just turn around and slap him, to be honest. He's been 38 years lying on his mat. He replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, but Jesus slipped away into the crowd that was there. And later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see you well, again, stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. It's calling for repentance. The guys trusted him and got up. Jesus saying the implication of faith is repentance. And the man went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who made him well. I bet they were really pleased. Do you think? Of course they're not, because religiosity does not find the real Jesus very friendly. Trouble. But the life giving, life rescuing, life enhancing, genuine Jesus is on its way. Because that's who he is. And it's coming to him, it's being sent to him by the religious people of his day. And in his life, that was always the way of it. Here was his response. Jesus feels the need to explain a little bit further. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. And Jesus said to them, My father's always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. And for this reason the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. And only was he breaking the Sabbath, he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. You see, the ambulanceman turns up and says, it's fine, he's going to live. He has no authority to say that. That's why we're outraged. Jesus turns up and says, uh, pick up your man and walk. And God picks it up and walks because he's got the authority to do that. That's the genuine Jesus. But the religious object to that authority. The Father raises the dead and gives them life. Even so, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. 
There's the key verse. John is introducing us to Jesus as the one who is the Lord of life, who gives life. Gives life not just in the pie in the sky when you die sense, but in the terms of the revolutionising of human life in the here and now, in our experience of life and of God. And we'll see how and to whom. Amen. Because it is conditional. It is not general. And you have to stay alert until he gets to that bit. It's all about life in these chapters of John's Gospel. Genuine Jesus, in word and deed, gives and sustains life. Not just the avoidance of death, but the gift of enhanced, more abundant and satisfying life. I am the bread of life. See the point? John has been showing that that's what Jesus does to people's lives, and now he comes out in words. I'm the one who gives and sustains life. I'm the bread of life. These chapters are making it 100% crystal clear. But in times of a great difficulty and pressure and, and life not being good, what people need is more of Jesus, because he's the bread of life. Because he's the one who steps in and speaks and changes situations and circumstances.